this morning is called There and Back Again. It is uh, February 22nd, 2009. If you recognize the title There and Back Again, it's one of the many things that I learned from the younger folks in the church. Uh, I did not read the Tolkien books. I watched the movies at the insistence of uh, friends in the church. And I noticed that the books were supposed to be based upon a earlier work that Tolkien discovered. Now this is all fictional, but they were about epic travels and adventures, journeys, if you will, and the original book was supposed to be called There and Back Again, A Hobbit's Tale. Now, we're not gonna talk about hobbits this morning, but we are gonna talk about journeys. And when we say journey in English, you can think of a lot of things. You can think of a heavyset black guy with a funny haircut that played the bass guitar and is now a judge on American Idol or the rock group that he was part of. You could think of the Webster's Dictionary, which is to go from one place to another. How boring and bland to go from one place to another, to call that a journey. But the Hebrew definitions are much, much more vibrant. As usual, they're graphic and expressive. And the Hebrew word for journey is derek, and kind of like the word derek, but with a bigger emphasis on the beginning of the word. And it doesn't just mean to go from here to there. It doesn't necessarily just mean the path that you're on to get there. It has much more to do with the course of your life. And understand something, when God calls you from one place to another, it's not just about getting from here to there. It's about the entire direction that your life takes. And more than a highway system that takes Nick and Lindy to another state, what we will see is that God has set them on a direction that determines the way their lives will be defined. And I would say obedience is a great place to start. You know, it's not easy for them to leave one state and go to another, to leave friends and family and churches and babysitters behind to go be isolated. But anybody that has ever been on a journey knows that there's something that happens along the way that helps change who you are. The word direct comes from direct, one letter difference. But the etymology of the Hebrew, so that you understand this, is one word that they have begins to branch off and take different meanings that are more specific to situations. But the origin of all of this has to do with the way that a bowstring is drawn. See, their course for life is a little bit like a path that a bowstring is being pulled on. Yes, there's a path, there's a here to there, but the whole thing is about ultimately determining a direction and hitting a target. And these couple, they're, they're going to hit their target. I believe that. I've been in the faith now with lots of people. In the last 16 or so years, we've seen a lot of people that started blazing pace and have not finished. I've been absolutely broken hearted to see many of my friends that started in the faith vibrant and full of life not finish well. Somewhere their path, their course, their direction for life got off track. And what began well didn't finish well. I want you to know today I have no fear that Nick and Lindy will get off course. You may second guess the choices that they make at times, but you can never second guess the motive. The motive is obedience. And if you really believe Romans 8, 28, if you really believe that in all things God works for the good of those that love Him and are called according to His purpose, it's okay if they miss a turn on the journey. God will make it work towards their course in life, the journey that they're on. And that's a very relaxing and comforting thought. And I thought that would be a place to start with you today because if your heart is grieved like mine, hurt, that we are going to be separated from some miles from our friends, understand something. Everywhere they go, every event in their life is part of God's toolbox to fulfill His purpose for them. When you think of the great men and women of faith that have gone before us, which is what we have to do, we have to reflect on what has happened before us to give us some sense of direction for our course. 
This is how we build a trust in God. We look at the other people that have set out from one place, journeyed on a course of life to another, many times not even knowing where they were going, and wonder, how did it turn out for them? Is there a reason to put my trust in this king? Or am I foolish? Or is this what some would call blind faith? That expression has no place in Christianity. There is no place for blind faith. Everything that God has ever asked us to do, there is a demonstrated track record of Him fulfilling and performing in other people's lives with the promise that He's no respecter of persons. If He did it for Charlotte, He'll do it for Michelle. If He did it for Michelle, He'll do it for Debbie. I found that our God is a God of wonderful symmetry. He sends one couple to a place they're needed, and He brings another couple to a place they're needed. This is our God. Any commander And where would any organization, government, kingdom be if the troops said no and second-guessed their commanders? We can't. So when I began to think about Abraham, the father of the faith, I mean, you have to start with the patriarchs. When you look at Abraham, you see a man who begins as Abram. An exalted father. But he begins on a journey to a place that he has never been and he doesn't even know the way there so that he must follow God every step of the way. He knows where he left, Ur of the Chaldees, but he does not even know where he is going. And somewhere along the way on that journey, he's transformed from an exalted father to the father of many nations who the entire earth will be blessed through because of his trust. A journey's not going from here to there. It's about what happens along the way. And it was not Abraham only any more than this is Nick's journey only. How about Sarah? Her name was not Sarah originally. It was Sarai, a bossy, drill sergeant type woman. That God changed into Sarah, a princess with God. A woman that all women can pattern their lives after. What would have happened if they simply said... No. I'm comfortable here with Tara, my father, who the word says is an idolater. I'm comfortable right here where I've made a living inheriting my family's business. What would happen? Where would the people of faith be? As you move on from Abram, you can't help but go to Isaac. Isaac began a journey to the land where Abimelech lived. He had a choice, a natural choice before him to go to Egypt Maybe like a choice to set up a state farm agency in your backyard. <laughs> and God said, I said no. And along the way, Isaac goes to the land of Abimelech where there are Philistine rulers. And he camps there. And he makes mistakes just like his father before him had made mistakes. Both of these men got into a difficult situation and said, <clears throat> She's my sister. <laughs> they weren't brother and sister. But both of them also did amazing things. Abraham and Isaac both fought to open wells that enemies had closed so that people would have life-giving water. Those journeys, those experiences of failures and successes help define who these men are. And how do you define Isaac's life? As a boy named Laughter? As somebody who made a mistake and uh, called his wife his sister? As somebody who merely opened wells? He's the man that fathered... Jacob, the prince with God. Jacob, the man who the nation of Israel descends from. He had to have done something right. He blessed the right kid even when he was trying to bless the other one. Talk about Romans 8.28 at work before it was ever written. These principles are true. That kind of blessing is upon the slaughters. In fact, I can think of no greater oxymoron in the world than the actual definition of the slaughterhouse <laughs> and what will actually go on in the slaughterhouse. <laughs> if you had a meeting called the slaughterhouse, that's, that's not really where you would expect to go to be edified. <laughs> but you've scarcely been around Nick or Lindy for any length of time and not found yourself laughing and feeling better about life. Most men wouldn't stand on a roof and dance that way. I will never forget it. Most women in their ninth month of pregnancy are not swinging golf clubs. There's something about them that brings levity to every situation. We know what that something is. 
It's the King of Kings that is transforming their lives. They don't get everything right any more than any of you do. And that makes it that much more beautiful. As you move on from Isaac, you have to get to Jacob. But before we cover Jacob, which is what our message will be about today, the life of Jacob and his journeys, I want you to turn to 1 Kings. In 1 Kings, we have a teaching that I've given before in the church, so I just cover it very briefly. But our message is called There and Back Again. So I wanted to start with there. When you get to 1 Kings 17, what do you say? There. there. <laughs> and why do we say that? Because there's a teaching about being where God told you to be when He told you to be there. In 1 Kings 17, starting in the first verse, it says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tish. Don't you love God's sense of humor? If he's a Tishbite, wouldn't you think he's from Tish? But God wants to make it abundantly clear. Apparently, God's people are sometimes stubborn. I wouldn't know anything of that personally. Mm -hmm. In Gilead, said to Abraham, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will neither be dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Mm. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here. Turn eastward and hide in the Kiriath Ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the Jordan. I'm sorry. You will drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kiriath Ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. When God says go, it's not up to us to say why. When God says go, it's not up to us to say what if. When God says go, it is not up to us to even count the cost. When did you do that, saints? When did you count the cost? When you became born again, you gave up the right to make these choices for yourself. You said, Lord, if it cost me my very life, this is what baptism was. A pledge to give your life for Him, among many other things that baptism is. But along the way, we want to take bits and pieces of our life back. We want to retain control in this area or this area. The successful walks in the kingdom have an irreclic, a reckless abandonment of self. They no longer consider their self worth preserving. They simply go where God says go. And an amazing thing happens. When you go where God says go, there is provision. The ravens feed you there. There is protection. Worldwide famines going on, but you are being protected. And there is promise. The promise that always follow is that the obedient will be blessed. What shape, what form your blessing takes? That's up to God. But when you are where He says to be, protection, provision, promise will be a part of your life. It always will be. This is not Nick and Lindy's first journey. And it will certainly not be their last journey. But this is the place called there in their life. God has said, I want you there. Nick's closest friend said, <clears throat> no. His pastor said, <clears throat> no, God's not doing that. <laughs> I don't know about the family. Maybe they got it right the first time. But I suspect that there was hesitancy. Because God's will often runs against the grain of our choices. Friends, if we made good choices, we wouldn't need salvation. It's man's choices that have got us in the situation we're in. Salvation is about throwing up your hands saying, God, I obviously have fouled this up. Would you help me? and His promise to meet that need every time. Christians get ourselves into dangerous situations when we, one, cannot admit failure. Two, when not only will we not admit it, in an effort to conceal it, we refuse all attempts to rectify it or have help because it would reveal it. Three, when we begin to blame God and others for the situation that we're in. It happens all of the time. Some of you men that were raised in a chivalrous fashion have a hard time letting anyone know that you're in financial trouble. Hmm. Yeah, that's a hard thing to do. Now what if they've had to help you before? Is that even harder? Hmm. So you can sink deeper and deeper and deeper. All the time God had somebody there that would help you. 
And what kept that from happening? Pride and that you did not ask. That's one thing to think about finances, and doesn't that twist your heart in a certain way? I mean, it makes me almost nauseous to think about being in that situation. Is it really any different with all of the other areas of our lives that we can drown in? Mm -hmm. Self-pity? Weaknesses of the flesh? <clears throat> and most of the time, help is just a phone call away. But what keeps us from doing that? Salvation is about death of your pride so that you can truly go where God says to go to hell with the consequences and I mean that quite literally when we make that choice protection, provision and promise will always be part of our life go with me to Psalm 57 they're found in the place called there there come on there, 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 there I want you to hear the voice of this man. I want you to hear the hurt, the joy, the near bipolar description that you're going to read is a commentary on all of the human race that has both the power of sin struggling in them and the power of righteousness. It's a commentary on the way that God shapes and forms human beings. Have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy on me. For in you my soul takes refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. Does that sound like a bed of roses? Does that sound like the prosperity gospel to you? God wants you fat, rich, fed, nice suits, beautiful jet, drug dealer's car, whatever ridiculous <laughs> appeal to greed they can make. He's in the midst of disaster but hiding in the refuge that is God. I will cry out to God Most High, to God who fulfills His purpose for me. You want to find real wisdom? Begin to fear the Lord and ask Him, what is your purpose for me? Sometimes He gives you a broad scope that is all of your life. He told me one time that my job, my purpose, was to excite people about His kingdom, to renew their walk, to cause revival in His name. So everywhere I go, it doesn't matter whether I'm in Illinois, it doesn't matter whether I'm in Texas or Louisiana, this is a broad brush that my whole life will be painted with. Other times His purpose for you is, I simply want you to go on a journey from Baton Rouge to Lafayette, or Lafayette to Texas, or Texas to Illinois. But things happen to you along the way that change who you are. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends His love and His faithfulness. If you never get into a precarious situation, you never find the precious Savior. If we sit at home, play safe, pretend to be Christians, dressed in all of our armor, but never going to war, where will you find God's unfailing love? Where will you find His faithfulness? Faith always puts something at risk. It always lays something on the line. There's always that element that says, but God, I'm going to be a fool, an idiot. Lord, if I do this, everybody is going to know that I missed it. And He just seems to cross His arms, smile, and wait to see what you do. I want to ask you a real personal question, each of you. Obviously, you won't all get to answer out loud. If you succeed in whatever mission of trust you're on, will the world really think of you any differently? But God will. If you fail in that mission, will the world really think of you any differently? You became a fool. You became an idiot. You became an outcast. Every one of those things. When you began to throw all of your trust in your life direction in a God that they can't see. When all of your hopes were dependent upon the fact that God raises the dead despite 6,000 years of people dying. We better decide whether we want the favor of the Father or the favor of our brothers. And when that die is cast, why look back? Why look back? In all of our reasoning, we cannot reason God out of the equation. I am in the midst of lions. I lie among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp and swords. Sounds like he's been in some of the same churches I have been in. 
Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. What does the man of God do in the midst of trouble? He begins to praise his God and that pulls you out. He begins to declare the goodness of God. One of the charges that I have for you, Nick, and you, Lindy, is that what you meditate on daily will determine the attitude with which you face the world. And if what you meditate on daily is the doom and gloom of some politician to advance his career, your life will begin to take on the shape of that vision. If what you meditate on, even though you're acknowledging there's swords and spears all around you, is the glory of God covering the earth, your life will begin to take on that direction. You say, well, Eric, is that magical? Is that a name it and claim it kind of thing? Because I was taught in the 70s that if you named a Cadillac enough, it would show up. I'm sorry, there have always been real and professed idiots in the church. <laughs> Some open their mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> no, what it means is that the meditations of our heart, what God is building into our heart, the desires of our heart, manifest in our life because that's our God. This is the promise. Meditate. That takes on this Eastern kind of feeling, doesn't it? Like you, you tend to think of the Shaolin Kung Fu studio and people meditating. Meditation in the Word is repeating audibly but at a lower pitch the Word of God to yourself. It is reminding yourself of the Word of God. They spread out a net for my feet. I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my path, my life's course or direction. But they have fallen into it themselves. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake, my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all of the earth. One thing that all journeys do is they take you through disaster. They take you through piercings with swords. But they take you through glory as well. You make no mistake. Where there is no suffering, there can be no glory. If it was not hard, anybody would do it. It's when it is very hard and you trust God that there is glory in it. One of the things Nick and Lindy will get to glory in is as they take journey after journey, as they go where God has told them to go, regardless of the consequences, something begins to happen. A steadfast spirit begins to develop in you. And the best way I know to describe steadfast is somebody who simply will not be moved from the path that God put them on. This is why when Nick and Lindy met me, I was walking and praying although we had no income for about three months. Someone was holding it and refused to give it. We were staring at presents under Christmas trees we thought we would have to return and it was the very first Christmas in my adult life that my entire family was assembling at my house. Does that sound like a journey to you? But what I had learned through my previous journeys was God did not bring me this far to let me fail. Yes. And I repeated it over and over and over. And I didn't get it all right. I didn't tell very many people that this was going on. There were probably people there that would have helped me. Part of the journey is crushing pride too. Not as far in that journey as I am in some of the others, but I am on the path. This couple is on the path. When we think about the way that journeys transform us, in addition to being steadfast, you need to turn to Ephesians to hear what this process of disaster relief brings. You'll be in Ephesians 3. We're still on the topic of there. Galatians, Ephesians. General Electric Power Company. Giants eat peas and carrots. The great and exalted Preston Coles. <laughs> I wonder if he ever gets to listen to a message. I want to just throw something in there that make him pick up the phone and call me. Tell me, you in Ephesians 3? Okay, let's pick up in 3.14. 
For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom His whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of His glorious riches He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being. This is my prayer. Not just for Nick and Lindy, but those of you in this church that are truly on a journey. You're trying to be something more than you are today. You are trying to grow and succeed in the Lord in some area where you have failed. You are trying with all of your heart to get to the place that God has said He wants you to be. That is a journey. And He will strengthen you in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith or your trust. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. It is in these journeys where you are needing rescue, where your faith is being assaulted, when your life feels like it's on the line, that you find out the height, width, depth of God's love for you. Because it is easy to stand back and say, God can do anything. Anybody in here ever done that? How about a show of hands? God can do anything. Anybody believe that? What is wrong with the rest of you? There's a Buddhist temple down the road that you could go to. How many of you can hold up a hand and say you believe God can do anything? Okay, good. Now we got 100% participation because I was going to have to send the deacons after you. But isn't it a much bigger step to say He can do anything through me? See, this journey doesn't teach you that God can do anything. You already know that or you would never have set out on the journey. It teaches you that He can do it through you. And friends, there is such a distance between this place and that place that it's called the journey to get there. Nick and Lindy are increasing in their knowledge and their belief that God can use them. How many of you have relationships that are defined by other relationships? Here's a classic one that is godly. Who's that? Oh, that's Eric's wife. Who's that? Oh, well, that is so-and-so's brother. Who is that? That's so-and-so's cousin. There's nothing wrong with that. But somewhere in the kingdom, God puts you in a place where the only thing that you are is His. And He does that for a reason. He does that so that you begin to know who you are in Him and that He can move and work through you. It's not dependent upon everyone else. Friends, it can be a painful process to get there. It can feel very alone. Why would God do something like that? So that you find out there's a friend nearer than a brother. So that you truly learn to lean on Him. The years in Lafayette in my life were lonely. They were difficult. But God began to give me what I needed. People began to show up to teach. People began to show up to help us. But there was a time period there where there was nothing except Lord, we don't like your people very much. <laughs> we like you. We would like to be liked by you. You can keep your people. My wife and I grew in our relationship with each other. I began to focus with a renewed vigor upon my children. I began to hone back in on the idea that ministry flows from your family and nowhere else. That the home is the basis from which you operate to bless everyone else and not the other way around. I didn't realize it, but in my journey prior to that, what I had done was figure that I would go bless everyone else and figure the home would just take care of itself. That is not right. It's not right for you. Well, it's not right for me. It's not right for any other person that you think is a great man of God. This is why at all biblical leadership, it is required that your home life be a certain way because it grows right out of your home. On their journey, they will find God's protection. They will find God's provision. They will find God's promise. But they will also grow in their knowledge of who they are in God and to each other. Who would want to be denied such a thing? But it can be a difficult process to get there. That's why so many stay home. I am proud of you too. Are going. In Exodus 13, I won't read this to you. 
because I won't finish if I keep reading it to you. But I rarely <coughs> lie when I preach. So if I quote the verse, you can write it down. You can go back and see whether I have created a King Eric version <laughs> or whether or not I was actually quoting to you the word. In Exodus 13, you want to write down 17 and 18. It says that the Israelites left Egypt fully armed for battle. But God did not take them upon the shorter road. He took them the long way around. Because God himself was concerned about the people that if they face too much battle, they might get discouraged and turn back. If you have a concern that Nick and Lindy are going somewhere and will become isolated, that they're going somewhere and they'll be attacked, and what will happen to them then? And what will happen if you are not right there to help prop them up? You need to know that the general who called them is faithful. Yes. He has armed them completely for the task ahead. And still, he evaluates the heart to see what they can and cannot handle. And he will not bring them more warfare than they can handle. That is reassuring, saints. The Israelites were prepared to face any army in the world the moment they left Egypt, and they were dressed for it. But God only brought them battle on a scale that they could handle it. Come on, somebody ought to say amen. 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 Uh, when you move from there, you need to know, you can turn to Numbers 33 with me, that not only does God prepare for you the order of your footsteps, not only does He dress you for battle, but there are discernible steps or stages in all journeys. This is not going to be difficult. It's not three points in a poem. It's not the kind of thing that you will have to memorize. I bet all of you will remember it right after we point to it. In Numbers 33, starting in the first verse, it says, Here are the stages in the journey of the Israelites when they came out of Egypt by divisions. When you move down to the little paragraph that starts with three and ends with four, you find out that their journey began with judgment upon the gods of Egypt and the deliverance of the people. What does that sound like? Salvation. Your journey began the moment that you were born again. After this, when you read, you will find out in verse 8 they face tribulation. You'll find out in verse 9 they face blessing after tribulation. You find out in verse 14 that they find tribulation. And in verse 50 they find blessing. See, there's a repeating pattern in all journeys. It is that you face difficulty. It helps shape you, define you, refine you. And there is always blessing the other side. Always. The only time you don't see blessing is when you give up before you get where you were going. And you never quite know how close you came to success. I love, I, I'm, now my father, you know, he, uh, he's a world class athlete and I'm not. So I have to get on a treadmill with him in the mornings at the Y. And Pop can walk on that treadmill and his heart rate doesn't rise. You know, I mean, it's like a machine. There might be one of those titanium skeletons in there. I know his knee is. <laughs> and a CPU inside the mind, just like the Terminator. <laughs> but for me, my heart rate is going all over the place. Easy to get frantic. And I watch that clock. Pop stares straight ahead. He can read, he can watch the sports center. Eric is staring at the clock, going, one more second. I can make it one more second. I made it. Good. One more second. And doing that. And I do that for 30 minutes with almost every second. It is so difficult to judge where you are in the stages. But when you look backwards upon it, you can see, wow, I went through a difficult period and look how God blessed me after that. And then I went through another difficult period. And look how God blessed me. And we love our mountaintop experiences and we whine and moan about the valley, but where do things grow? How many of you have ever seen a water well at the peak of a mountain? No, they never are. The situations in our life, like bowstrings, that truly determine our direction come from the difficult times. The blessing is having made it through it, knowing who you are and knowing who your God is. I think probably if we don't get to this now, we will never get to it. So let's go to Genesis 28. My sister gave me a birthday shirt. Some of you saw it. said, 
help, I'm preaching and I cannot shut up. <laughs> there. Amen. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We are glad not to be on the second story. Nobody named you Titus. This means that I will not have to lay on you. If that sounds very weird to you, you need to read your Bible more. Paul laid on top of Eutychus to raise him from the dead when he preached on and on into the evening and Eutychus fell out of the window. Yeah, how about that? So in Genesis 28, I want to talk to you about Jacob, the patriarch with which we will close talking about his life. We went from Abram to Abraham. We went from Isaac to a man who fathered Jacob and really is credited with the starting of Israel in that he birthed the man Jacob. I guess he didn't do it alone. Actually, the most, the largest part of Isaac's life recorded in Scripture, the promised supernatural son, was obtaining his bride. Now, who does that remind you of? So in Genesis 28, we will start in the 10th verse. Does that sound fair to you? I want you to notice provision, protection, and promise. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. You thought your pillow was bad, right? But when you hear what happened on top of this stone... You'll, you'll trade your posturepedic for this stone, I promise. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway. This is different than Led Zeppelin's stairway. <laughs> he saw a stairway resting on the earth and its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. I want you to think about this for a moment. What did he see? He saw the hope of all mankind. A way to reach the presence of God. A way for the presence of God to reach you. He saw what he would later call a gateway to heaven. There above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abram, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. And you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and I will watch over you. Does that sound like we have a promise? Mm -hmm. Does it sound like there is protection? Yes. And if he is with him and watching over him, does it sound like there is provision? Mm -hmm. It does. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Isn't that good news for Nick and Wendy? Yes. I will not leave you until I have done for you what I have promised. Mm -hmm. If they do their part, trust Him. God will do His part. Let every man be a liar. Mm -hmm. God is faithful. Mm -hmm. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place. Good call, Jake. And I was not aware of it. Yeah, I can see how that could happen. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. The journey that begins and ends at Bethel is really the gateway to His kingdom. You want to be found in His kingdom? You need to be where his presence is so that you can receive direction. You need to dwell in His presence. Well, when is your journey over? Oh, it's not when you reach a certain place. It's when you are in the house of God and He tells you, the journey's over in this area. It's time to begin again. The there is going where He tells you to go. The back again is that, guess where Jacob finishes his journey? He goes all the way into foreign lands. He obtains the wives that God has for him. That's a crazy story in itself. He learns to deal with unscrupulous employers. He learns how to deal with his unruly brother. And you know where his journey ends? In the house of God. Now, an amazing thing, this is actually a physical location. It's where Jesus says in John 2, what if you see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man? He was calling himself the house of God. And they understood it. This is a physical location in Israel. For our lives, it's not a physical location, it's a pathway in life. This couple will set out in the house of God, presence of God, 
and journey to Illinois, and their journey will end in the house of God. The there and back again is that life is comprised of a series of journeys, and you don't know how many, and you don't know when they're over, and there is no retirement. You can all retire from secular work. That's just fine with me. We'll put you to work in the kingdom. There is no retirement. There is always, Lord, your presence moves every day. I'm where you told me to be. Where do I go next? The gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. I would say the city got an upgrade as far as it's name. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone. We just read that. Verse 20. Then Jacob made a vow. If God will be with me and watch over me. Isn't that what God just said? Yeah. And on this journey, I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house. Then... The Lord will be my God, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will, pillar will be God's house, will be Bethel. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Something happens when you are in the presence of God. When you're in the presence of God and He determines your journey, your destiny, there is a part of you that says, probably can't do this by myself based on my previous track record. Lord, I want to show you that I trust you. I want to show you that you're in charge of my journey. I want to show you that I really am going where you said go, and I know that it's not by my own strength. So the first tenth of everything that I get, I'm going to give back to you. Now, an amazing thing happens. This is not because God is a banker. I know that he's been reduced to that on TV, that he returns sevenfold investments like Bernie Madoff. <laughs> that God is the originator of the pansy scheme. But in the Word, He requires you to give because it shows that you trust Him. That you're on the journey and that you trust Him. You're not paying Him. You're not bribing Him. You're not buying His security. That's the mafia that does that. What you are doing is saying, Lord, I acknowledge this journey that you've called me on. It's bigger it's bigger than me. And I couldn't do it with all of my resources. To show you that, I'm going to give you the first part of all of my resources and just put myself in your hands. Mm -hmm. That is a great, great system. Mm -hmm. What happens there is you get to see in every area, I didn't have enough to start with. And look, he came through. And you develop a steadfastness. You develop a trust in him. You begin to find out who he is and who you are. Now, amazingly enough, as he sets out on this journey, you know what the first thing that he does? Well, Abraham opened wells. Isaac opened wells. So Jacob goes, and he rolls away a stone that no one else could roll away. Nick and Lindy are beginning in trust. They're going to a place where God's protection, provision, and promise is for them. But the biggest thing that I know in my spirit they will do is they'll roll stones out of the way so that people can see Jesus and get to the well of salvation. I know that. I know that there will be people that will sit before them broken. That have misunderstood God because God has been misrepresented to them. And the testimony of their life and their journey will roll stones away. Mm. You know, Jesus didn't need a rock to be removed to get out of the grave. The rock was removed so that you could see resurrection power. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 57 begins with build up, build up. Prepare and remove the obstacles out of the way of my people. For I dwell in the high and lofty places, but also with him who is broken and contrite in heart. Mm -hmm. Our journey must ultimately be about other people. Abraham was called to be an exalted father of nations so that all nations could be blessed through him. Isaac was called to be a promised son so that all the earth could be blessed through him. Jacob was called to be the prince with God so that all the earth could be blessed through him. Nick and Lindy are called not to go just be in a state farm agency. That's the brook. 
That's the ravens. But so that somebody's life, like the widow at Zarephath, might have stones rolled away and the presence of God come in and heal what is broken. This is our life. We are God's hands and feet. He's not a quick, get-rich-quick scheme. What our God is, is a repairer of the brokenhearted. And the way that this gets done is when people are willing to remove obstacles, even if it costs them something. Like they leave their mother and father and go to a land they've never been to. Turn with me to Genesis 32. I have a couple more verses for you, and then... I'm going to invite some people up here to share. By the way, the Isaiah scripture was Isaiah 57, 14 through 15. Jacob sets out and he goes where God has called him. Many years have passed. He's experienced setbacks and victory. He thought he was marrying one woman, he married another. Nobody can relate to that. <laughs> I thought I'd just married a princess. I found out I married a princess with God. Isn't that awesome? Yes. I thought I'd just married a beautiful woman. And I married a woman that's beautiful inside and out. The truth is we all marry one person and grow with another. This is because all of us are being formed and shaped in the image of God. That's, that's the way that works. Grow with each other. As a side note because my wife is staring at me with those laser eyes. In Genesis 32, starting in the ninth verse, Jacob had set out, and now he is on his way back, about to cross the Jordan. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord who said to me, Go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. See, once he got there, God said, I want you to go back. Isn't it an amazing thing? I'm not talking about locality here. I mean, I would love for Nick and Minnie to come back at some point. But you can never really go back to the place you were in. They will be different. We will be different. It is more about every time you get comfortable in a place, every time you start to get the routine down, he says, I'd like you to trust me a little more. He's like a sales manager who moves the quota every time he does. <laughs> yeah, I know some of you are feeling my pain. <laughs> And I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. An amazing thing happened on this journey. Jacob went from somebody who would trick you to get the blessing because he just deserved it. To somebody that knew he didn't really deserve it, but God had given it to him anyway. Journeys are a wonderful maturing thing. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two groups. Save me, I pray. And he goes on to talk. When he crossed the Jordan from the house of God the first time, he had a staff. I mean, of everything that he had, he had a staff. A staff, by the way, had the events of his life written on him so that he could lean on what God had done for him and that would carry him to the next place. The staff was enough. Whatever Nick and Lindy have, they have the testimony of what God has already done in their life. And it will be enough. But when you see them again there will be so much more. Because the obedient are always blessed. They left with a staff. They came back with literally hundreds of people and animals. Isn't that amazing? They left, Jacob left, with one level of maturity and they came back with a whole nother. They left with discord with Esau. They come back to a relationship restored with Esau. They leave Jacob, somebody who's willing to fight for God. And on his way back, he has an experience where he wrestles with God and man. It's on the next page in your Bible. Verses 26 through 32. And look what happens. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Where did he learn that he was entitled to protection, provision, and a promise? He learned it on the journey. And he recognized he was having an encounter with God. He was not going to let go until he got it. The man asked him, what is your name? This is a very Hebrew way of saying, what's your function in life? Jacob, I'm somebody who struggles, he answered. 
Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but will be Prince with God. Ultimately, all of us are on a journey from somebody who struggles with the sinful nature, struggles with what God's called you to, struggles with what man desires of you, to a person who is a prince under God's command. This is our journey in life, if you are willing. Because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Overcome what? Overcome God? Not hardly. You have overcome the struggle itself to understand what it is truly about. Humbleness, love, mercy, justice. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask me my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. Mm -hmm. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel and he was limping because of his hip. Every journey will leave you with a new walk. Every journey will leave you with a new focus. Every journey will leave a mark on you so that you remember it and your walk with God is forever changed. This journey, much like their journey to Rockford, the Master's Commission, this journey, much like the journey down an altar, much like journeys in and out of hospital rooms, much like journey that brought Lily to us, the journey that brought Caleb to us, it will leave them with a slightly different walk and a walk that magnifies God's name. This is very much about Nick and Lindy, but it's also about you and where you are in your journey. Did you give up? Did you pack a lunch and just camp under a tree? You're waiting for somebody to come along and carry you. Discouragement is a normal part of every journey. If you just sit and count the mile markers, they don't come fast enough. We must meditate on God's Word. So I have two words for Nick and Lindy that are also for you. One is Jeremiah 50, verse 25. This is on my list of super fantastic, terrific scriptures. Tell me when you're in 50. There. Now 25. There. The Lord has opened His arsenal and brought out the weapons of His wrath. For the sovereign Lord Almighty has work to do in the land of the Babylonians. Let's do work, son. <laughs> what God says is I have seen the people that are oppressing you. I have opened my arsenal and I will surely defend you. Nick, Lindy, no matter what happens wherever you go, your God has an arsenal at His disposal. He's sovereign in your life and you're proving that by your obedience. He considers it His job to uphold you. This is true for you too, saints. He considers it His job. I have work to do in the land of the Babylonians. My sister once beat up six boys at a swimming pool <laughs> because they were dunking me. I was a scrawny, weakly child. And I couldn't yet breathe water. And she rescued me. She had work to do that day. What do you think it means when the God of the universe reminds you I'm sovereign? and I have work to do in that land. Mm -hmm. There is no power that will stand against us. There is no power of the enemy that will overcome us. Nick and Lindy and you and your journey will trample on every lion, every cobra, every scorpion. Even if one should manage to strike you on the heel, ultimately you'll crush its head. All you need to do is trust and put each foot where God has said to put them. The last scripture I have for you before we invite Brother Mays up here to share something and then anybody else that would like to is in Hebrews. Please turn with me to Hebrews. By the way, in Genesis 35, 7, he's back at Bethel again, but this time he calls it God, God's house. El Bethel. <laughs> I guess it just got better all of the time. Tell me when you're in Hebrews. Yeah. We're going to be in Hebrews 12. In Hebrews 11, the author, whoever he may be, has listed journey after journey after journey that men have been through. 
Men whose weaknesses were turned to strength. Men who routed foreign armies in battle. Women who led nations in battle and overcame. Prophets who were sawed in two. People that went through amazing journeys for God. And then Hebrews 12.1 picks up with this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked for us. We must not only go on the journey, we must persevere on the journey. And along the way, everything that would trip you up from the course in life that you were set on like a bowstring drawn to fire a target, you must avoid and step over and go through or go around, go under, whatever it takes. Because God called you somewhere. How do I do something like that? Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. How do I know how to do this journey? How do I know how to trust You, Lord, when everything around me looks like it is swallowing my very life? Well, Micah 2.13 said He sent somebody who broke open the way so that Lord Himself would walk before the people showing them the way that they would go. Friends, Jesus is the author and perfecter of all who trust in Him. If your journey begins and ends in the house of God, you cannot fail. He will take you there and back again. And the only thing that will change is you. You'll grow to be Him. I'm going to invite my brother Gabe up here. If any of you would like to share any encouraging words to them, this is not the Vatican. You do not have to submit it in writing. It does not have to be infallible. It doesn't have to come with a certain dress or a certain hat. You don't have to wear certain clothing or burn certain incense. We require one thing. That your words be something that would assist this couple on their journey. Amen? Amen. Amen. Alright, so I'm not that long-winded. Um, but there's no way I could allow this day to go by without addressing Nick and Lena together as a couple. And um, up to this point in our lives, Nick and I growing up together, it's always been me the one that's leaving. Um, whenever we...